Okay, so I guess it's a good time to get started. We have a pretty tight schedule. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining this session, showing interest in Linux and encryption and in performance. So those are the three topics I'm gonna to be talking today to you. Um, my name is Daniel Soldo. I'm a performance analyst at IBM R&D in Germany. In uh, the southern part near Stuttgart, we have a, one of the largest IBM R&Ds out, outside of the US. So basically, to know um, a bit more about, about myself, just short introduction. I'm actually coming from a little country in Europe called Croatia, uh, from the city of Split. Uh, four years ago, I, I, I did my studies there, and uh, let's say four years ago, I made a jump into the southern part of Germany in a little town called Böblingen. Uh, the main reason, and yeah, probably the only reason to do that was the IBM R&D in Böblingen. So uh, as mentioned, it is the largest IBM R&D outside of the States. And um, besides other things, uh, it is also the home of Linux on the IBM Z platform. So. This is basically the stuff I'm doing there. Combination of Linux on Z, performance evaluation, and crypto, and let's say the performance evaluation of the crypto stack on Linux on Z. And um, Linux on Z, IBM Z is basically the mainframe. So I guess it's a pretty known name uh, during all these years. This is a picture of the first mainframe released in the 60s. So uh, it's a pretty, pretty old platform, but it is still very much in use. And currently, it, is, it looks something like this. So it's a very modern platform. It's a scale-up platform. So you can imagine it as a very, very big server. Um, the current version goes up to 170 CPUs, each CPU running at a uh, rate from 5.2 gigahertz. So it's kind of a kind of a really power, powerful machine. Most of the airlines today, most of the insurance companies today, most of the um, banks today are still relying on this machine. It, we have Linux running on it, and the, uh, it is a growing business. The interest is there. So uh, going to see the, the, the future should be interesting to work on it on. But uh, today's talk is motivated by something called data breaches. And the last year or two, we're, we're seeing uh, data breaches getting quite a lot of traction also in the media. So we, we don't have a month uh, without any big, w w without seeing a big uh, name, a big famous company having a data breach there. Um, it, the interesting fact about data breaches is that it isn't always someone else uh, who suffers from them. It might also happen to your company. It might also happen um, to um, some partner company you're working with. And um, there are some interesting facts we found out in some of the recent uh, reports we had. And um, the most shocking ones are maybe that an average data breach costs around $4 million. So it is a, it is a serious um, it is a serious threat which should be taken seriously as well. Um, what I found interesting about all these data breaches in the last I guess in the last six years, only four per, four percent of the data which breached was encrypted. So. Um, everyone knows about encryption, and but we're still not doing it enough. In Europe, we had last year a um, interesting regulation called GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. And in one part of GDPR, they state that companies may face fines up to 20 million euro or 4% of their annual turnover, whichever is bigger. Um, it still doesn't mean that it, it, it can be taken as simple as it is stated. 
because there are, uh, there are a couple of uh, measures all the companies can do to avoid paying such big fines, such as reporting the data breaches as soon as possible, such as giving their customers some other benefits to, to, to avoid um, big to, to avoid um, big costs for the customers. And um, in the last year, so GDPR came around May last year. So one year after, we had around 56 million euros in fines. Um, interesting fact about that is that the biggest fine was around 50 million euros. So um, the rest of the fines during the whole year there, there have been around 6 million euros uh, which have been distributed on different companies. So um, the rest of the fines haven't been that big, but the general opinion is that the, regulationary, uh, the, the regulatory bodies of governments are still warming up, so the bigger, the bigger fines are still going to show up. Uh, a few examples, this is pretty fresh news we saw the ICO uh, from the United Kingdom, they, they showed that they stated uh, their intention to fine British Airways for around above, uh, above 180 million pounds and Marriott International with a fine of around 99 million pounds. So there are some serious fines there and uh, we, gotta, um, we gotta keep track what, what, what's going to happen with those companies. But um, yeah, the, the situation is getting, is getting serious. Um, one interesting thing there is that the data breach fines, they may sound really serious, they may sound big, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there is a nice study from Deloitte. They showed that it's only the tip of the iceberg and that the real costs are actually hidden at the moment, the real costs will hit the companies in the years to come. So for example, they identify the value of lost contract revenues during the next five years, or for example, the brand devaluation is going to happen during the next couple of years. So they identify those uh, those costs to a company as a much more serious than defines. Anyway, um, there are ways to protect yourself and there is a site called GDPR Associates and you may find it online. They prescribe a number of methods how to protect your businesses from data breaches in an efficient way. And um, maybe the number, one, the number one way to protect the data is encryption. Encrypting it and having a backup policies this is, this is, for most of the businesses, the number one step to go. So um, maybe some other examples are updating security policies, um, doing, doing uh, regular risk assessments. But uh, I would like to point out this point, staff training and awareness. So it's, there are a number of reports recently which showed that uh, uh, and I guess in the first quarter of this year, around 70% of the data breaches uh, were caused by, uh, by employees having their passwords saved in plain text files. So raising the awareness and providing some more education to, to the employees is, is, is of great importance to play the data protection game. Um, so let's get back to encryption. It, it's been identified as, as the number one uh, way to protect yourself. And uh, what about encryption? Why should we actually do it? Um, I try to divide it maybe in two, in two groups. Uh, one of them is to prevent the data breaches. And um, we saw a number, a number of data breaches which happened and they, they have been serious only because of when the breach happened, the data was exposed directly. It wasn't encrypted. So for example, Equifax, they had a huge data breach. Once the attacker was inside, he just found huge databases full of plain text data. So it was like, just take, take the data without any consequences, without any obstacles. 
So um, encryption is a very simple mechanism to uh, maybe not to implement, but for a lot of people to understand. But uh, it's a very powerful in terms of it helps very quickly to reduce the attack surface. And uh, the other side of the story is uh, big enterprises, they do business with um, a lot of, um, in, in a lot of different industries and uh, one of the, and all these inter industries have some re regulatory bodies um, c coming up with regulations which they should follow. For example, the payment card industries regulations, the GDPR as mentioned before, or the, the Health Information Privacy Act. So uh, to be compliant with all these regulations, uh, a lot of them request the big companies to have to have encryption mechanisms implemented. So by having encryption implemented, it is a very quick way to be compliant to a lot of these regulations. And um, there's this big question, why, why are we still not doing it? And um, maybe one of the first answers there is performance. When we talk about performance, the Second thing everyone thinks about is IT costs. Okay, it's nice and simple, I will implement it, but then I will have my IT costs, let's say, raised by 30%. Uh, the, the IT folks, they are faced every time in, in, in a lot of discussions with executives how to reduce the IT costs, and then they come up with some crazy idea like encrypting everything and then the IT cost jumps 30%, so no one likes to hear that. Um, missing skills as both a technical reason and a organizational reason, so find the right people and educate. No one, yeah, I mean, we, we all have a lot of, a lot of stuff to do and uh, we, we lack some time to do the proper education, but yeah, that's, that's a time management issue all the companies have to face. It's also interesting to see that we, there are countries which block encryption of data. For example, HTTPS, uh, there are countries which block HTTPS and if they not manage to block it completely, they try to, in, uh, in a few different ways, they try to degrade the performance of HTTPS. So there are a couple of also political reasons why encryption isn't implemented in some cases. But um, the, 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 the focus of this talk is actually on the performance of encryption in Linux and uh, how did it evolve and what actually happened in the recent time. <clears throat> Recently, um, there's been vis visible a, a focus of a few vendors to show that low-cost encryption is actually possible. So marketing charts are often getting, um, getting a charts like this. For example, uh, from the Intel platform uh, using the ISNI instruction, which would improve the IS performance on the Intel platform, they claim that there's less than 1% overhead to encrypt 100 gig of data using the, using the ISNI instruction. IBM, for example, with the IBM Z platform, we had, with the recent machine, there's been a aggressive marketing campaign called uh, promoting a feature called pervasive encryption. So the focus has been all the time, okay, let's shift from selectively encrypting only critical data to pervasively encrypt everything we have in, your, in, in our systems. And to do that, we had to do some hardware optimization. We had to improve the uh, actual infrastructure we had there. So there have been a couple of hardware optimizations which led to significant performance improvements. So we saw in, a, in some cases, we saw up to 18 times faster encryption. Or in some other cases, up to 93% lower cost of encrypting. So just by switching off, on, just by upgrading the machine to the latest one. And yes, 
while talking about encryption in Linux, uh, we, we, can, we, can def we can separate the whole encryption on three different, um, three different groups. So the first one being data in flight or data in transit encryption. Um, maybe the most known, most used uh, algorithm standard there is TLS, which is actually in Linux implemented in the OpenSSL package. There are a couple of other examples, but um, my a couple of my next slides are going to be uh, talking mo talking mostly about the TLS standard. Um, data at rest. Um, when talking about data at rest encryption in Linux, mostly the discussions start with Lux and DMCrypt and uh, everything uh, revolving around them. Um, data at rest encryption, it's interesting because we may talk about different levels of, of encryption. They are uh, about different granularities. So we can talk about file system encryption, for example, or let's say database encryption. So it's just the difference, the granularity. Um, data in use, it's, it's a quite uh, trendy topic. It's, it's been, uh, we saw on the first day of this open source summit, we saw at the keynote that um, this week there has been this, um, how is it called, Confidential Computing Consortium uh, presented, and it's uh, actually handling this issue. There are a number of vendors, a number of companies uh, who are joining forces, and uh, we see a lot of movement in that area. Um, so these are some examples of, of technologies already available there, but uh, be, be sure that uh, in the now in the, in, the, in the time of cloud computing and the time of multi-tenancy, um, it, this is a very important aspect of encryption and the focus is, is, is getting and getting bigger, I guess. Um, about TLS, Google has an interesting transparency report and um, in the, this transparency report we may find that since 2015 uh, there's been a great increase of usage of TLS this uh, chart shows only the usage at the Google Chrome uh, browser. And um, it's kind of interesting to see, okay, right now we're mostly above 90% of uh, TLS coverage on all the websites on the internet. But it's also a bit scary to see that four, only four years ago, every second web page um, wasn't using TLS at all. So. An improvement has been made, and uh, yeah, it uh, should probably not get worse. What happened last year? We had August 2018, we had um, the new TLS standard, TLS 1.3. It's been an update almost after 10 years of the TLS 1.2 standard. So um, finally, we got an update. And um, regarding cipher suites, we got only five cipher suites now. Uh, this is very, it was kind of shocking, but it's very interesting to see that uh, TLS 1.3 is limiting us to the usage only of five cipher suites. It is uh, quite different compared to the TLS 1.2, which had, I guess, almost uh, over 20, 25 cipher suites to select from. Um, the important news there is, is that we're limited only to use authenticated encryption uh, ciphers for, for the symmetric parts. So it basically means from the, all, all of the IS modes, you may only use cipher suites which use ISGCM mode. And, um, and the other one is Cha Cha 20 Poly 1305. Uh, there are also some new crypto algorithms. Uh, as mentioned, ChaCha20 is there. And um, also interesting, the key agreement uh, method X25519. Uh, I'm going to be talking later a bit more about it because it, it is, it's using a elliptic curve uh, named curve 25519. Which, which, brings on, which brings in a bit more performance and um, yes, and uh, 
the key exchange part, it uh, restricts us only to uh, ep ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. In the TLS 1.2, it's been possible to use Diffie-Hellman not ephemeral. So it basically means right now uh, we have the key generation be mandatory. So every, uh, every new handshake, every new TLS connection is generating the key um, from the beginning. So uh, it, in a way, it gives us the perfect forward secrecy. Um, TLS 1.3 promises superior privacy, security, and performance. Uh, regarding performance, they simply, um, simply by reducing the size of extra data and the handshakes, they managed to, to get some of the performance improvements using these three different uh, uh, cipher suites. I uh, have some... Um, the, the, the guys from Wolf SSL, they, they made some measurements publicly available. So just by, just by switching from TLS 1.2 to TLS 1.3, they got this performance improvement between 6 and 15% using these different cipher suites. <clears throat> uh, elliptic curve cryptography. As probably well known, uh, RSA was before was probably the most used asymmetric uh, crypto algorithm. But uh, in the recent years, it's, uh, RSA suffered a couple of attacks and uh, there are known vulnerabilities. So elliptic curve crypto is basically the way to go when talking about asymmetric uh, encryption. And, um, and this link you'll, you, you'll find an interesting comparison of the popularity of different curves which are available. We see that the, the, that the P256 uh, curve is still the most used uh, and the, the most popular. Um, very interesting article. Uh, the author, he tries to compare these curves to popular singers today. So for example, he says that this curve is like Beyonce and this curve is like Cardi B. So it's kind of fun if someone's interested in elliptic curves. And, but we see, we see the um, rising share of, of the uh, curve to 25519. And this curve is basically set as the default in the TLS 1.3 standard. And uh, yes, we have some performance number here, numbers here as well. And um, <clears throat> it also, it's maybe, no, it's maybe important to note that these performance numbers, one should take them carefully. And uh, it, they basically highly depend also on the application which is, the, which is implementing them. Uh, these numbers are an example from a um, Nimbus Jose project uh, uh, using JSON web tokens. And they saw like 14 times better performance using this curve compared to the P256. Also, what is the, the curve is known as to have better performance as the prime curve, but another argument why, P, why someone should use it, well, you, you may find, find it quite often online. Uh, people like to use it because it's not a NIST, NIST approved curve. So they connect NIST with NSA and the government. So let's keep the crypto away from them. <laughs> so as um, mentioned already, the TLS 1.3 enforces authenticated encryption. So it basically means moving all, all these cipher suites using ISCBC mode are moving to GCM. And some data from Firefox state that we already have the vast majority of, of websites using ISGCM mode. So around 88% of all the websites currently are already using GCM. Maybe uh, more reasons why, why to switch to GCM. Um, Different vendors have also noticed that GCM is the way to go. There are hardware instructions, hardware improvements in that direction. And this is, for example, a comparison of three different Intel processors, comparing the throughput with GCM against CBC. And in all of the cases, G GCM uh, does, has, does have a lot 
better performance than CBC, maybe up to three times in the final case. I, at IBM with the Z14, um, as mentioned before, there was a great strategy in the direction of uh, motivating people to encrypt everything. So the hardware improvements we introduced there, the, uh, when comparing the IS cipher modes, you may see GCM down here showing an improvement of around 12 times compared to the former machine. So um, the focus has really been set on improving the performance of, of the hardware there. ISXTS mode has also tremendously improved the performance. The point with ISXTS is that it's basically selected as the mode of encryption uh, to go while doing data at rest encryption. So XTS is the preferred mode for data at rest encryption, data in flight encryption, GCM. The focus is clear to see. Um, Intel also has some nice charts showing a lot of improvement in the hashing performance. Also CBC and GCM showing solid improvement to previous generations. Uh, when talking about DMCrypt, um, it basically serves us as a good way to enable transparent end-to-end -end volume encryption. So uh, one, of the, one of the major uh, benefits of using DMCrypt is basically the transparency. What does it mean? It's, it's, it's a, it's a um, trans transparency in these terms means basically that the uh, developers don't have to change any application code. So you don't have to implement uh, encryption inside of your application. Your application can remain uh, intact and they will, they will uh, write data encrypted at the disk. So um, the good thing about the encrypt as well is that it's basically a device mapper target. So you can combine it with other device mapper targets such as logical volumes, such as multipath devices, and so on. And um, LUX, as you probably have seen before and know about it, LUX is, uh, I guess everyone uh, has it already on, on his laptop, so while booting the laptop, you'll probably provide a LUX password um, because it is widely spread and widely used uh, by desktop, by server, and by Android smartphones as well. So the Android disk encryption is based on LUX and DMCrypt. So it may have different formats. The most popular one is LUX because it uh, basically integrates a header in your uh, encrypted volume, and in that header, it will be saving your encryption key. So if you're not using it, if you're using the plain mode, you will have to think of a safe place where you could, where you could store your encryption keys. Um, these are some numbers I made comparing the latest IBM Z14 compared to the uh, previous one. And um, to be honest, I was, I was hoping to see um, the, the performance um, gap between no encryption and having the encryption turned on. I was hoping to see it at very close, maybe below 10%. Um, but in this case, I got around 20% overhead having the runs, having, having the um, encryption turned on compared to the no encryption case. Um, the third case is by using protected keys. Protected keys is basically a mechanism of protecting the encryption keys by encrypting them with a master key. So um, yeah, we may talk about it offline if someone is interested. Right now, let's just focus on the clear key, uh, clear key bar here. So I got around 20% degradation of my throughput just by turning encryption on. Uh, important to note here is that in this case, the workload I had, it was um, direct I.O. and it was synchronous. So having synchronous I.O. basically means that every I.O. request is waiting for the previous one to finish so it can start. So 
direct, direct I.O. meaning that I'm not using any means of caching, so I'm just I'm avoiding any kind of patch, page cache in Linux. So I'm, in this case, I'm actually having one request encrypted and getting it down to the disk so I can then send the next one. So it's far away from a realistic use case. It's maybe, um, one, one could say that it's possibly the worst case scenario. But for us, it was, it was kind of important to see, to see um, how does it look like. And um, what happened is that in the, by the end of 2017, uh, we already had that uh, Linux kernel 4.12. And with the 4.12 Linux kernel, it has been possible to, um, to extend the sector size at the device mapper layer level. So by having that, in December 2017, uh, we finally got the Lux, Lux2 support, and Lux2 uh, made it possible to use the 4K sector size in dmcrypt. And just by turning that on, uh, the encryption overhead also in this case got around, got, got to about 8%. So um, this is basically what happened only in the, in the Linux world. So this example is on the IBM Z14 uh, platform, but um, it isn't bound to the platform itself. It is already shown on a conference, 2016, I guess. Uh, it's already shown on a ARM Cortex processor. Um, the guys, they didn't have that Linux 4.12 kernel at the moment. They just um, uh, hacked the kernel they had at that time and had to patch uh, the kernel by themselves so they could use the 4K sector sizes. And already in this case, they got an improvement almost a factor two. So the same effect seen by the, on the IBM platform here shown on the ARM platform. So it's platform independent and uh, could be tried on any platform. Uh, what also happened is uh, in the beginning of this year, uh, Google, um, <clears throat> Google presented uh, Adientum as a new cipher for data at rest encryption. And the cipher is basically uh, optimized for embedded devices, for uh, IoT devices, for smartphones. And it, they claim it provides five times better performance than the usual XDS mode used for data at rest encryption. So uh, it's based on ChaCha20, ChaCha20 um, having the maximum amount of 20 cycles. They use 12, so we could claim they are using ChaCha12 cycles. Um, I'll try to go quickly over this. So just to give a few examples that hardware uh, acceleration is really used to, uh, first of all, to offload CPU cycles from your main CPU, and secondly, to get, to get better, better, uh, better performance in encryption operations. So for example, the Z14 has coprocessors on each core in the machine, you have a different, you, you have another little processor just specified for, for the crypto operations. Uh, another thing are PCI Express cards, which are used, first of all, as HSMs, and then, of course, also to accelerate mostly asymmetric crypto operations. Intel has Quick Assist technology, which is also an interesting um, example. It's also a PCI card, and uh, it, gives in, it gives improvement in crypto. It gives also improvement in compression. Compression is uh, very commonly combined with encryption because, it's, it, because of performance reasons, of course. So to, to be in time, I'll <laughs> go over the a couple of future topics which are going to be interesting in the next, in the next uh, couple of years, of course. Uh, Data and use protection, we already saw it fresh this week that there, there are big, thing, big things happening and uh, big things are going to be happening, I suppose, in the next uh, months, years. Uh, cloud HSMs. HSMs are a topic for themselves. It's just a hardware 
a piece of hardware where you can safely store your master keys, your most valuable pieces of data. So in these cloud environments, um, customers want to have safe mechanisms how to store their keys so that their uh, cloud service provider can't even know them. Uh, quantum resistant crypto, quantum computers are emerging, they're coming, so people uh, got together and trying to get some new um, algorithms which could resist also the quantum computers. And polymorphic crypto is also a very nice topic which is going to, going to happen in, a, in the next time, but um, the guys doing polymorphic crypto, I guess they're hoping a lot to see the, the um, presentations of quantum computers. So, because at, with, with current computers, they're lacking performance to do it, to do it um, how they would want. Quickly to just recap the key takeaways. So, it's important to stay up to date with crypto and security news. So, we have it every month. Uh, there are new stuff, there's new stuff coming out, uh, just improving performance and getting new functionalities, so uh, keep up with the news. Uh, another thing is we should raise awareness and education level. We saw that a lot of data breaches are made because, because of uh, lacking education and awareness on these topics. And uh, performance evaluation of your workload, it's also uh, very important because uh, different types of workload uh, do perform differently by use of encryption or not. Um, it is a good thing in every company to start doing the evaluation by themselves. And uh, again, a lot of vendors of hardware, they see the, they see the requirements in the encryption space. So they, there are a lot of improvements. And um, as customers, the, the best thing we can do is just try to use them and try to exploit them. And yes, and that should help you in your data protection journey. So um, thanks a lot for your attention. I guess uh, we have maybe a minute or two for additional questions if there are some. Yes, please. Right, right. So I'll repeat the question quickly. Uh, what are the tools I use to measure the performance to see the differences? Um, I used, I guess, just two simple tools available at the Linux community. The, the one is a flexible I.O. tester, FIO. So I guess everyone in the Linux world who does some kind of I.O. evaluation already knows about a tool. But um, uh, FIO and uh, uh, SAR, SADC, SysStat, those are maybe some, um, this is one tool which may be used to, to just follow the system performance, but I used it to get some um, more uh, CPU utilization numbers and so on. Yes? Side effect. Uh, so the question was regarding boot time impact. Um, yeah, that's a good one. But I, but I guess, um, but I guess most most of the uh, bigger systems um, are not. Uh, I mean, that could be an interesting question uh, regarding uh, containerized workload or uh, virtual machines. Uh, but. Uh, the, the, the focus was, in, in my case, was mostly on a bigger, bigger kinds of systems, bigger, uh, let's say, databases, bigger instances, which don't really do a lot of rebooting, in, uh, if, if not necessary. So, uh, yes, but um, regarding boot performance, it, it could be maybe, and uh, yeah, but uh, there, it, en encryption isn't uh, used that much in, in, in that step. Maybe secure boot uh, processing has been done, but uh, it's, it's, it doesn't take a lot of the time in the whole boot process and both boot sequence.
Yeah, another question. Yes. Do you have any experience with uh, applications who need to access that information, that encrypted data? Uh, what is the possible performance uh, degradation from accessing it with, you know, an encrypted uh, Right, right, right. So the question was, do I have any, any experience with applications which would reach the encrypted data and what would be the, uh, the effect? So. I did, I did some evaluation with the Postgres database. So having a Postgres database mounted uh, above the encrypted volumes, both transactional, both data, both log. And um, I saw by, I, I had a um, generator of requests aside, uh, HammerDB, and it has been hammering the database all the time. And uh, I saw around 5% uh, throughput degradation by having a encryption implemented at all layers. So it was kind of interesting because this kind of benchmark is a micro benchmark. It's synthesized only to measure this particular part of performance. So, but having a database, for example, and then it's like more a realistic end-to-end -end scenario. So in this case, I saw around 5% degradation, so, so to say. So, well, yeah, I'll wrap it up and conclude. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention and uh, have a great weekend. And yeah, before that, a great rest of the conference. So, thanks a lot. Thank you.